Have you ever asked yourself, what tests am I missing? Well, everyone has faced that, at least at some point. And that's why in this video, I want to share with you a checklist that will help you as a test scenario idea generator. So whenever you feel blocked and you don't know which should be the next test, you can reach out to this list and use it to spark some new ideas. And before we go to the list, let me warn you just two things. The goal of this list is not to inform you about the tests regarding the specific logic that you are implementing. That's up to you. It's more about those common things that will happen so many times on many tests and you need to address them. And the other thing that I want to warn you about is that some entries on this list might not apply to you because of your language, because of your framework. As an example, if you have a compiler in place, some of the things that I have on this list might not apply to you because you can't even compile code like that. So you can take it and adapt it to your use case. So let's take a look. Okay, I have here a file that is a Markdown file that by the way, you can grab it as a patron if you want to use this template in your day to day. And I have here a few sections. On each section, you will find some entry points that you can think about to try to spark some ideas of what you could be testing. So the first one is this one of check for scenarios of zero, one, and many. So most of your tests will need to take care of those cases. And by the way, two counts as many. So if you are working with lists, for example, this is the type of case where you need those three, the zero, one, or many. In some cases, you just need to think about the zero or one. But for example, if we are talking about the count balance, you should think about scenarios with zero transactions, one transaction, or two or many transactions. By doing that, you make sure that you cover all the scenarios. The next one is checking for missing parameters. This might not apply in many languages, likely it's not applied to you. However, in some cases, in some languages, in some frameworks, you don't need to provide all the arguments when calling a function. And on those cases, you might need to perform this type of check. Another one is checking for null parameters. Null or undefined, depending on the language that you are using, this is extremely important, so make sure that you exercise the code with a null and see how it behaves when it is a null. Next one, check for mismatched parameter types. So is the thing that I'm getting the one that I was expecting? If it's a typed language, usually you will not need to think about this type of things unless you are doing some crazy things with objects and things like that, but often you don't need to think about that. But in many languages, you need to do these checks by yourself. Next one, check size or length. What does this mean? It means that you need to check things like the maximum capacity of a list, for example, that list can be empty or not, but also you can be testing things like the length of a string, for example. What's the range that you can expect data for that input string? Next one, check for special characters. I can give you a good example. Once I've built a system, that had um, codes to identify some entries. So that code would be used in, in things like URIs, all of that. We test with a lot of scenarios like numbers and all sorts of characters, but we forgot about one thing, things like emojis, for example. Do you accept an emoji as a valid input of that field? It's the type of thing that you need to think about. But also you need to think about foreign languages like Portuguese, for example, that has some characters that don't exist in English. Next one, check for domain-specific rules violations. As an example, imagine that you have a field that will receive a string, for example, but you expect that that string is a valid email. So when you have a meaning associated to an input, you need to check that. You can use the example of the email, the phone number, the postal code. There's a lot of scenarios that you can find. The next section is the output handling. So anything regarding the returns of your functions or methods. So what we have here, ensure that all possible logic paths have defined outputs. So you will implement your code and based on the inputs, it might go through multiple paths. It in, depends on things like if statements, for example. And you should think about by providing a given input, if it will be exercised in a different way, you need to make sure that you are asserting that expected output. So in other words, is thinking about from the branching of your logic, if there's a if statement that it's not covered. For example, it's quite common to see scenarios like um, and Nelsie for an if null statement to not be checked on your tests. 
And since we are talking about if null statements, check for null output scenarios. In many functions or methods, it's common to return some type of data. And when you don't find it, often you, we use null as the meaning that this thing doesn't exist. So make sure you have a, a check for that. In fact, there's another type of result or return that a method can have, that is an exception. And regarding exceptions, you should think about things like if all the possible exceptions are handled. So if you look into the code and there's a throw exception, and then for example, you have a catch, you should try to understand if all those things are being handled and covered by your tests. But also if your tests are returning exceptions, are throwing exceptions, you should have tests covering those. Why? Because they might happen. And also you can use those tests as a documentation of that code. So if you have, for example, a third party consuming that contract that you are exposing and you are testing, you will make sure every single time that something happens, the exactly same exception will be thrown. And the last section is external interaction. What does it mean? We are now talking about the boundaries of your system. So anything that your code needs to reach out to the outside world. So you are consuming an API, you are, for example, working with the database. So when you are testing those adapters to the external world, what types of things you can think about to make sure that you have a decent coverage of code. One thing is checking the external contract that you have with that entity. So by looking to your tests, how sure are you that if any of the parts broke that code and that contract that they have between them, that you will spot those cases. And you can apply this principle not only to things like APIs, but also, for example, if your system is handling messages that come through something like Kafka, you can think about these things as well. How will we react if we receive the poison message? Another one is to check for the external system availability. How does your code will react when, for example, is trying to reach a database or an API and it doesn't respond? How does it react if you can't open a connection to the database? Another one is handling cases of missing data. Once again, let's say that you are using an external API, an external database, whatever, and you are trying to reach for a given customer or product, something like that. And when you go there, it doesn't exist. Are you covering those scenarios to make sure that it is replying what it should be replying? Is it a null? Is it another type of thing to signify that that you couldn't find it. Last but not least, in this type of tests is to make sure how the system reacts with timeouts. As an example, imagine that you are calling a REST API and that REST API might timeout after a given set of seconds. How should you react? What type of errors should happen? Should you log an error message, for example? Those type of things also require tests. Okay, so besides all of those questions that I've shown you, I recommend you to take a look into mutation testing. It's an amazing tool to understand what is missing in your tests. And if you are not aware of what it is, mutation testing, and you want me to do a video on that, please leave a comment. There's also another testing approach that is highly disruptive that I honestly believe that you should know. I'm talking about property-based testing and I have a video about it right here. And before you go, please let me know if there's any other entry that you would add to this checklist.